with all that said, let me turn it over to Eric Johnson from my phone that we Eric will take us through the presentation. And Eric, you should be able to, uh, uh, I can share the, uh, the screen's coming up. Thank you. If I can ask my uh, commission members to please hold questions to the end, unless you have a burning question that cannot be held, we will have questions at the end, and we will end promptly at noon or before. Eric, over to you. Thank you, Senator. Just a sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, virtually today. I'm joined by my colleague, Carrie Schlichting, and we will tag team this presentation and uh, happy to take questions. Uh, this presentation is essentially background on the role of the ISO and some of the, uh, the, the resources and uh, the outlook that we see for renewables in New England. Uh, we won't be making any specific recommendations in this presentation, but we're certainly happy to support the commission as you do your work uh, leading up to your report to the legislature. And uh, while it's nice to be here virtually, it would be even better if I could swing by Flo's Clam Shack and grab something to eat while I'm in town, but we'll have to take a rain check on that one. So for the, uh, the intro, and we will make these slides available for anybody who wants to see these uh, after the fact. Uh, we have, as an organization, we've been responsible for overseeing the region's electric power system since 1997. And we operate under the jurisdiction of the federal government and specifically the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And if you, if you think about the primary responsibility for the ISO, it's, it's reliability. It's making sure that the transmission system in New England can serve the demands for power today, tomorrow, uh, five years and 10 years into the future. And as an organization, we are set up differently than a number of the other companies that participate in this system. And uh, the ISO is the independent system operator. So as an employee, uh, we cannot own any financial interest in any of these companies. Uh, you would have to divest that when you join the ISO team. And that's true for our senior management and our board of directors as well. Uh, another thing that sets us apart is that we are neutral when it comes to technologies. So the markets are designed to select the lowest price resources. Uh, we don't uh, apply any preference for any particular uh, technologies that can supply power to the system. And I'm gonna take us up to about uh, slide 16 and then I'll turn it over to Carrie. So the roles of the ISO fall into three major categories. Uh, the grid operation in this category, you can think of the ISO as the air traffic control for the power system. This is the first responsibility that FERC gave us back in 1997. And if you think about uh, air traffic control, they don't own any planes or runways. They just make sure that planes take off and land safely. Our job is to make sure that the supply and demand for electricity is balanced uh, in real time, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So the ISO is uh, operating continuously, uh, working very closely with uh, our partners in uh, Rhode Island, uh, National Grid, uh, Terry and his team to make sure that we have a reliable system in the state and in the region. When I refer to the high voltage system, we're talking about the larger lines that typically would cross over the, uh, the interstate highways, uh, usually on, on the steel poles. We're not talking about the distribution system that you would see running through uh, uh, residential communities or down Main Street. Uh, that would be the lower voltage distribution system and the ISO does not operate that directly. The second area is the administration of the wholesale markets. Uh, it's the second area that we were given responsibility by FERC. And we essentially provide the equivalent of the New York Stock Exchange for New England. And we don't buy or sell on behalf of consumers for the most part. We provide a market platform where buyers and sellers come together. And in this market, we're not talking about retail customers. We're talking about uh, companies like a power uh, generator that could sell into the market, the utility that might be buying on behalf of their customers, or a competitive supplier that might be buying on behalf of the customers that they would then sell at retail. So the ISO administers essentially the wholesale market. And then the last area of responsibility is looking out into the future to make sure that we can keep the lights on reliably across the entire system on the 10-year horizon. 
Uh, this chart is pretty busy on slide four. It's showing all of the entities that have input to the work that we do. So while we do oversee and operate the New England power system, we are responsible to the FERC, as I mentioned, uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC, and the Northeast Power Coordinating Council. They all set reliability standards for the country and the region, and the ISO needs to operate to those standards. So the uh, independent board of directors, as I mentioned, uh, they, they are profiled on our website if you wanted to see who the members of the ISO board are. And then there are really two distinct communities that we think of within the stakeholder process in New England. Both of them have input to the work that we do. Uh, first would be the New England Power Pool or Knee Pool. Those are the people who own the assets that are tied into the grid. Uh, they would certainly have a financial interest in what's happening with the transmission system and the wholesale markets. And then on the right-hand side, we have a number of state entities that could be the governors, uh, policymakers such as yourselves, consumer advocates, uh, attorneys general, the PUCs, uh, Office of Energy Resources, folks like that throughout the region. And we have lots of interactions uh, with them as well. And I'll just uh, pause on the, the NEPOL angle for, for a moment. Senator De Palma talked about the grid when it was initially designed was focused on generators, not uh, smaller resources that could put power into the grid. But within the NEPOL system, uh, there are sectors for end-use customers and alternate resources. That's the, the latest sector that joined uh, NEPOL. So there is a very uh, robust discussion about uh, smaller resources and the opportunities that they have to participate in the wholesale markets. And that's continuing uh, to evolve with some direction from the FERC. If we had a chance to bring you to Holyoke, and I wish we did, we would uh, show you the control center. And this is a, uh, a view of it. So we have a system operator here who's a uh, in the building in Western Mass, uh, staring at about uh, eight workstations with data coming in from all over New England. And then we have a large uh, wall board, which is about the size of a, a billboard, an electronic billboard that you might see driving down 95. And it's streaming data in from not only the New England grid, but we can see what's happening in New Brunswick, Quebec, uh, New York, and beyond our neighbors to the PJM system, the TVA system, and uh, out to the Midwest. So situational awareness is very important for our grid operators. If you think back to the blackout in uh, 2003, one of the challenges for our team is they did not have visibility, clear visibility beyond the borders for New England. And when the outage happened in the vicinity of Cleveland and cascaded to New England at about nine seconds, the, the operators didn't see that coming. So they have much wider visibility on the bulk power system than they did in the past. And that's a significant enhancement for reliability. When we think of New England, it's a pretty large region, but it's part of a much larger system. And here you can see in orange, this is the Eastern interconnection. It's one of three interconnections in the United States. If you go from the East Coast to the Rocky Mountains, we are tied into the system. This is part of an AC or alternating current network which means the power flows based on where the demand is on the system. If you hop across the Rocky Mountains, you have the Western interconnection, and we do have ties to that system, but it is uh, DC or direct ties, direct current ties. It's a different technology. And then the third interconnection is uh, most of the state of Texas, and they operate as ERCOT. So we are part of this uh, large system, and from a reliability perspective, it's very important that all of the system operators are abiding by those uh, NERC and NPCC reliability standards. So a problem in one region doesn't cascade to another. On slide seven, this is a depiction of the transmission network in the region. So we're not looking at highways here, but it's the highway for electricity. The backbone of our network is the 345 kV system, and that's shown in blue. We do have some 230 kV and then the other 230 shown in, in green, and then the state road equivalent would be the red. That's 115 kV. Most of what we operate is down to the 115 kV level. There is some lower voltage transmission, but this is largely the uh, set of assets that are under the control of the ISO. And again, we don't own this. So companies like National Grid, Eversource, they would own this uh, system, and they would 
operated in the field, but they do that under the operational authority of the ISO because they are tied into uh, other systems here in New England. And we're not an island. We do import, and the predominant flows are from uh, Quebec into New England. And on any given year, about 20% of our energy needs as a region uh, are imported. We tend to export power to New York. And for the most part, power is flowing uh, into higher priced uh, markets. So we've made significant investment in this system, about $12 billion. And there are proposals for some further investment, but they're not necessarily for reliability. It's to build transmission to bring uh, clean energy or renewable energy uh, into the load centers in New England. And we'll highlight that a little bit later. When we think about the grid, in New England, there's about 350 generators. The largest of those are the nuclear stations in uh, New Hampshire and Connecticut. And then we have uh, a number of uh, gas-fired generators. The largest of those is in uh, the Boston area. If you total up all of the generation in the region, it's just over 31,000 megawatts of capacity. That's iron in the ground here in New England. Now, that is an evolving mix. Uh, we've seen significant proposals for new resources, and most of that is wind. But we've also seen retirements and uh, a number of large stations, uh, nuclear plants, coal plants, uh, and including some gas plants are, are retiring. So we are seeing lots of interest in coming into the market, but we're also seeing resources that are probably uneconomic or beyond their uh, planned life expectancy and will be phasing out. And as I mentioned, looking at uh, resources, uh, demand resources are is valuable as a generation. So if a system operator can activate demand response or call upon those resources to take demand off the grid, uh, that helps as well. And we have a number of those resources. And New England actually has been a leader in bringing those resources into the wholesale market. We think about the uh, demand for electricity. We've seen some significant changes in the, the pattern over time. You have to go back to August 2006 to see the all-time demand, uh, peak demand in the summer, just over 28,000 megawatts. And the reason it's been uh, so long since we've seen that peak demand is largely because of the energy efficiency investments that the states and the utilities have made on the order of about a billion dollars a year, New England-wide. So that has brought down the demand for power. And we've also seen a lot of solar resources which are typically located on the customer side of the meter. And so they are having an impact on the demand on the grid itself. And so those are two of the, the biggest factors that are shifting the demand in the region. When we think uh, longer term with our planning responsibility, uh, not only do we wanna make sure that the grid is reliable, but any developer that wants to build a new power plant, could be a gas fired plant, could be a wind farm, could be a large solar array on the transmission system. We would study each of those projects. Our study process looks at the reliability of the interconnection. It doesn't look at the best site or the preferred resources or the best size. We're just making sure that a project that interconnects to the grid doesn't cause any adverse impact to anybody else who's tied into the system. So really it's each individual uh, power plant company or their investors that are making the decision about what type of resources should be coming into the market. And as we'll talk in a few minutes, that's heavily influenced by policymakers and the desire for clean and renewable energy. And every couple of years, we roll up our planning process into a document called the Regional System Plan. And uh, we did that uh, two years ago, and this year we'll be doing that. Again, it culminates in a, uh, an annual meeting, a public meeting, where we talk about those plans and we're happy to share that information with the members of the legislature. Thinking about the wholesale market, if you roll up all of the buyers and sellers in the market and you look at the volume of electricity that's transacted, it tends to vary over time with one significant um, variable, which is the price of fuel. So if you look back to 2013 and 14, you recall we had the polar vortex, some very cold weather drove up uh, demand for fuel, for natural gas, that drove up wholesale prices. But then in 2016, we had a relatively mild winter, and we saw that the annual price of electricity at the wholesale market has fallen down to um, 
this much significantly lower number. So each year, looking back to 2012, you can roll up the energy market price, which is the electricity we use uh, uh, on a, on a real time basis, and then the capacity, which is a forward market to make sure that we have enough resources lined up to meet peak demand plus our reserve and reliability requirements. So the combination of those two gives you a pretty good approximation of the total cost of the wholesale markets for the New England region. And then we'll be updating this shortly for the values for, 2019, uh, for 2020. Uh, so on slide 12, this is looking back at two points in time. It's uh, 2000, which is the first, first full year of the wholesale markets and 2019, the last full calendar year. So you can see where does the energy come from in the region? It's been relatively constant with nuclear, although we know over time those numbers are likely to get smaller as nuclear plants retire. Coal and oil once combined about 40% of the electricity in the region have really fallen off the map. So we produce very little electricity in New England from coal and oil resources. And typically that only happens on the oldest days of the year or sometimes during a heat wave. And those are the resources that we see heading toward retirement. The big shift has been to natural gas. Uh, once only about 15% last year was almost half of the electricity. And if you're following this on a real-time basis day to day, we've seen those numbers up into the 60% region. So the ISO website and the ISO mobile app allow you to track the fuel mix in real time. And that changes Pretty, con pretty regularly throughout the, uh, throughout the year. Now, if you look to the right side of this chart, you'll see that the renewables have not really taken off between 2000 and 2019. That might give you some pause. But when you think about the driver of the renewables, one of the big drivers is the RPS standards that have been place, put in place by the states. And we know that there are significant uh, increases in the targets that the states have set. So we know over time, if we look at this chart in another 10 years, you're going to see that coal and oil are probably not even on the chart anymore. And the renewable numbers are going to go from about 11% to something significantly higher. So this is not a projection. It's just where we are versus where we've been. I mentioned that the imports are a significant portion of our uh, mix. So this takes that same energy production from last year, but it also factors in the imports into the region, which is about 19 or 20%. So you can see that the natural gas shrinks as a percentage of the total production if you include the imports to the region. Now, what happens in the wholesale market when you have a system that's tied uh, significantly to uh, natural gas? Well, when prices are low for natural gas, then we see prices for wholesale electricity are relatively low as well. But if we run into some physical constraints either in New England or beyond New England, it can have a significant impact on the prices that we see here. Uh, the, the first big incident that affected New England was when the hurricanes hit the Gulf back in 2005. When that infrastructure came back, we saw prices settle down. Then the economy was uh, going really strong up until 2008, but then it took a slide. And then as the demand went down, the prices went down. And on the right-hand side of the chart, Every time you see a spike here, this is driven entirely by the very cold weather that we see in New England. And in a year when you don't see a spike, it's because it was unseasonably warm. So that phenomenon of, of price volatility in New England is likely to continue as long as we uh, have to operate with the existing fuel infrastructure in the region. We are not, as an organization, expecting uh, any further fuel or natural gas infrastructure to be developed here in New England. Uh, I'm gonna skip over slide 15. It's painting a similar picture of the data we just showed. And uh, the last thing I wanna highlight is the uh, state's preference for uh, decarbonization of the economy. And it's shown here with the uh, five New England states that have adopted by law a legislative mandate to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see pretty consistently across the region, they're looking for 80% below a number back in the 1990 or 2000 timeframe. But this is not just looking at the power sector, this is looking at the economy as a whole. So in order to achieve this, you're gonna have to go beyond just shutting down coal and oil plants. You're 
going to have to look at electrifying transportation and buildings so that you are reducing the use of fuel oil and fossil fuels in those sectors as well. So, Senator, I'm going to turn it over to Kerry, but I'd be happy to pause to see if you have any questions so far. Uh, would you like to wait for the end, Eric? Or and uh, I'm ahead. happy to do that, if, but if you had any clarifying questions, I'm happy to pause for you. Maybe for the group, we'll wait until the end. Uh, my, I do, too, but my concern would be, <clears throat> given the number of questions I'm sure we have, I know I have a, a few, we wouldn't hear what Terry's going to say, so I'd like to be able to uh, use your time most effectively. Okay. Uh, hear what Carrie has to say, and then we'll do questions at the end. All right. Thank you very much. So I'll turn it over to Carrie, who will highlight some of the changes we've seen in emissions. Great. Thanks, Eric. Everyone can hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. So as Eric described in some of the earlier slides, we have really seen a change and a large shift in the types of generators that are providing the majority of the energy in the New England area, uh, very much driven by the state policies and greenhouse gas emissions goals and renewable portfolio standards. So this chart shows that from 2001 to 2018, the changes in emissions have resulted in a significant change for carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and sulfur dioxide emissions. You can see that CO2 has uh, dropped by 36% regionally, uh, nitrogen oxide by 74%, and sulfur dioxide by 98%. So while there are we still do, in the region, use fossil fuel generators. There has been a significant shift that has resulted in these emissions reductions. Eric, next slide, please. And a large driver of that, as Eric mentioned earlier, is the New England State's Renewable Portfolio Standards. And this chart shows the different goals per state. Um, these are constantly being updated as the states update their uh, targets. But it just gives you an idea that where we are now in 2020 and where the region is headed by 2040, and this is what's going to be really driving the changes in the growth in renewable energy that Eric mentioned. Um, so to talk a little bit specifically what we're seeing, Eric, let's move to the next slide. In New England, energy efficiency, solar and wind are really driving this change. So this chart shows the installed energy efficiency solar and wind projects um, from 2020, and then what for energy efficiency in solar, we anticipate and forecast, the ISO forecast for 2029, and then for wind, what's existing and what is proposed from our queue, which I'll describe uh, um, on the next slide. And this shows that while you know, currently in 2020, we have 2,600 megawatts of energy efficiency and almost uh, 4,000 megawatts of solar. In the next 10 years, these numbers are going to significantly increase. And specifically for wind, we see incredible proposal, a num uh, proposed number of megawatts coming on the system. And that is really driven by the states like Massachusetts and Connecticut and Rhode Island and the projects that are being selected in the clean energy RFPs. And it's just important to note, Eric, you want to move to the next slide, that what we're looking here for wind is shown here in this uh, donut chart, that these are the proposed resources that we have in the queue. As Eric mentioned, ISO New England studies projects that want to interconnect to make sure they can do so without negatively affecting the transmission system. And while we see that this is 65% of this queue is currently wind, and then solar and battery projects make up the next uh, largest chunk. These are just proposed projects. Not all of these projects will be built. There is attrition from the queue, but that this is currently what we have, and we update these numbers um, routinely. And if you had looked at this a few years ago, this chart would have been predominantly natural gas. But as you see now, natural gas plants make up only 4% of the queue, and many projects have dropped out. On the right-hand side, we break out the wind proposals and the megawatts per the New England states. You can understand which states are really driving these um, queue, this, these queue numbers. 
Um, there is a small amount of onshore uh, megawatts still being proposed in the New England region, but the drivers, the largest driver is offshore wind. And it is also interesting to note here that we see uh, battery storage really emerging as a new technology. Again, a few years ago, that number was very small, but there's more and more battery storage uh, looking to interconnect through the queue. Eric, next slide. In addition to uh, the project that we discussed on the previous slide, there are developers in New England are also proposing large-scale transmission projects to bring clean energy into New England. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the projects, the New England Clean Energy Connect that Massachusetts has uh, signed a contract for that is coming through Western Maine. And these are large transmission lines that would be bringing down hydropower. And there's also interconnection requests for offshore wind power off the coast. And this is in addition to studying projects that want to be interconnected to New England transmission system, ISO also studies what we call elective transmission upgrades, which would be these types of transmission lines. And there's a roughly 15 currently in the ISO queue. Eric, next slide. As I mentioned, battery storages are coming online. The grid currently has 20 megawatts of grid scale battery storage, and we see over 3,000 megawatts of standalone energy storage projects requesting interconnection. And while these are, projects are very new technology for the region themselves, the idea of stored energy is an old, as an old idea for New England. We have two large pumped hydro facilities, Bear Swamp and Northfield Mountain, which it, when electricity prices are low, use a technology that pumps water to the top of an incline to then be released when electricity is high and that release water then springs the turbine and, and creates power that goes back to the grid when prices are higher. And so these are like large hydro batteries that our grid operators are very used to using and are quick to respond to the system. Eric, next slide. Thanks. So this shows the solar uh, photovoltaic resources that I mentioned earlier and what we see being proposed in the region. Uh, Rhode Island on the chart on the left has um, an installed capacity of almost 160 megawatts in the region. Massachusetts is the leader uh, region-wide for installed PV, and it's driven by state policies. And as we I mentioned earlier, you can see that in 2029, we expect as a region there will be almost 8,000 megawatts which is really uh, remarkable when you look in, in 2010 that there were only 40 megawatts of installed solar. So this change is dramatic, and we continue to see these as the forecasts are updated each year through the ISO CELT uh, report, which is, comes through the load forecast committee, which we can talk more about. People have questions. Uh, this number changes annually, and this is the most up-to-date number, but we also anticipate to see more growth in these forecasts. Eric, next slide. This is a depiction of the duck curve, which I'm sure many of you are familiar about. When that, This shows that the dash line on the top of the graph would be what the demand would be without solar power in New England, and that the yellow section in the, with the solid line at the bottom shows the impact of solar on the grid on a day in May this spring where solar power output reduced the amount of demand below overnight lows. So basically there was so much energy being put onto the grid from solar PV that we that the operators ramped down the uh, other types of generators to below nighttime levels. And this is, you know, this is really a new phenomenon in the last couple of years in New England. It's been seen in California for a bit longer that as more solar comes online, this occurrence will happen more frequently. And it's just interesting to note that when you think about it from a grid operating perspective, not only does this uh, have the operators respond by ramping down other types of generation when this solar comes online, it, it adds a new type of uh, profile to the grid where in the afternoon when the sun begins to set, you can see that the demand becomes ramping up quite steep in a quite steep manner to the 8 p.m. evening peak. 
the type of resources that need to be online to respond to that quick ramp up of energy from the region is a different type of resource. And you have to be something that can respond quickly. Eric, next slide. I'm going to move quickly through a couple of these. This chart just shows ranks the New England state nationwide about their investments in energy efficiency. Rhode Island ranks fourth nationwide in this type of investment. And the other New England states are also leaders, which is why we see such large uh, installations and development of energy efficiency in the region. Uh, next slide, Eric. So when we talk about the significance of energy efficiency and solar PV investment in New England, this chart shows what that looks like for overall demand. So the two charts on the left show the projected summer peak, and on the right shows projected annual energy use. And the, the orange line at the top of these charts is the growth peak, so this and the growth load for the two respective charts. And that shows what type the amount of energy that New England would be using without solar and without energy efficiency. So when you take when you subtract the amount of solar demand solar production available, it reduces the overall demand. And that is the yellow line, both the second line down. You can see that solar PV is bringing down the overall demand in the region. But then when you add in energy efficiency, you get the green line at the bottom. So as a region, with solar PV and energy efficiency investments in the region, we are dramatically reducing the overall peak and the overall energy, annual energy use in the region. So instead of, um, in, instead of seeing the thir around 30, 30,000 megawatts of uh, demand in 2020 region-wide in the summer, we're, we see about 27,000. So there's a big impact on those investments that the state policies are driving on the regional grid. So Eric, I'm going to pass it back to you now to talk a little bit more about transmission planning that you and I have mentioned. Great. Thank you, Carrie. So our role as the regional transmission organization is to do transmission planning for New England. Uh, we do this through an open uh, process, and the stakeholder group is called the Planning Advisory Committee. Uh, many of the uh, folks from Rhode Island may participate. I know we've had representatives from the PUC, uh, DPUC, and OER have been uh, at the table for these PAC discussions. And this is where the ISO would roll out the scope of a study. Uh, it would look at the preliminary results, take feedback from stakeholders, and then finalize uh, the analysis for uh, transmission reliability needs. And as I mentioned, we roll that up into the regional system plan. Uh, all of this is governed by FERC. And uh, FERC put in place some changes through a process called uh, Order 1000. It did two things. Uh, created a path for the region to develop transmission for public policy needs. Uh, that has not uh, moved forward. I'm happy to go into that if there's any questions. And it also created a process for certain transmission projects to go through a competitive solicitation process. And uh, we did that for the first time last year with some reliability needs uh, in Boston. So I think the takeaway here is the planning process is iterative and uh, continually changing. And we do have input from stakeholders and uh, guidance from FERC on the direction of the plan. And just a quick look at some of the major projects in New England that have been developed for reliability. In uh, pretty much every state, including Rhode Island, there have been projects that have been put into service or are in the planning stages to make sure we can meet those national um, or NERC reliability standards. And if you think about the cost of that, th this is the cost to build for each of those investments over time. It's been about $12 billion uh, total for New England. And the region would recover this uh, over the time through a rate that's approved by FERC. And so you wouldn't see a big jump in your transmission rate in any given year just because the project goes into service. That would get spread out uh, over time. But it certainly has been an area where we've seen significant investment and there have been increases in the transmission component of the uh, electric bill. When you think about the cost of building it, 
you have to think about how do you allocate those costs. And in New England, under the FERC rules, we allocate that based on um, the contribution of each state uh, to the essentially the amount of power that's used. So Massachusetts pays almost half of the cost of any project, whether it's built in Massachusetts or in another state, uh, Rhode Island, about 6.3%. So that's just an indication that we are all part of this tightly interconnected system and benefit from having a reliable system across the six-state region. Um, I'm going to skip to the... My, I think this is my last slide here, and then I'll turn it back to Carrie for some information resources. The big shift that we've talked about in a couple parts of this presentation have been from uh, really two directions from the large central station power plants to distributed resources, but also from uh, a lot of fossil fuels to more renewable energy resources. So that hybrid grid is emerging really in, in two respects. Uh, we're seeing that pretty quickly. The shift that Carrie mentioned in the queue is probably the most dramatic representation where a couple of years ago it was mostly gas fire generation in the queue, and now it's largely wind um, solar and battery storage technology. So lots of uh, transformation happening at the regional level. And uh, Carrie, I think you've got a couple of slides to highlight some resources, and then we'll be happy to take some questions. Yes, thanks, Eric. I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of some resources that ISO puts out annually. We have a what we call the Regional Electricity Outlook that is published each year in uh, the early spring that looks at the biggest challenges and emerging issues for the regional uh, power system. And then each year um, in either in January or February, we uh, produce two fact sheets, the New England Power Grid Profile and the New England, New England State Profile that show key market and grid statistics um, for the for the region, and we can, we're happy to send links to these. These will be updated in the coming weeks, and we'll be glad to share them if there's interest. And then finally, Eric, next slide. I so recently updated our homepage and our newswire on feedback from stakeholders in the region. There's a just a change the way the information is presented and more information available on our homepage. So we encourage anyone who is interested in seeing real-time data to check it out. And I, as Eric also mentioned, there is a app that we have that you can download that gives you real-time information that allows you to see the resource mix prices, and it can be set. Uh, you can set up an alert for certain conditions or price levels in the region if you want. If you're following it closely, so we'll stop there and we want to again thank the senator for having us join and we're glad to take questions. Thank you Carrie. Thank you Senator. We'll turn it back to you. Eric and Carrie, uh, thank you very much. Exemplary exactly what I thought we needed to, uh, to help give us a perspective on electricity uh, in the region. I know I have several questions. I don't want to be the first uh, if we can go, uh, what, let's keep the change the way we had it. I'm going to try and, uh, well, that's, that's good. Let's bring the, bring the folks back in. If somebody has a question, uh, unmute and ask your question. I, guess. I, I don't know any other way other than, uh, or if you want to just, uh, if you want to ask a question, you're, view, you're viewing, uh, raise your hand, I'll call on you, otherwise just ask your question. 